This is Space Time Series 20, Episode 81. Coming up on Space Time. The first neutron star merger confirmed through gravitational waves. Mapping the far side of the Milky Way. And how stormy Titan sculptures its landscape. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Astronomers have for the first time detected gravitational waves generated by merging neutron stars. The findings reported in multiple papers in multiple scientific journals, including Nature, Physical Review Letters, Science and the Astrophysical Journal Letters, to name just a few, involved the detection on August 17th of the collision of two neutron stars, each slightly more massive than the Sun, in the relatively nearby elliptical galaxy NGC 4993, about 130 million light-years away. The collision generated more energy than the Sun's produced during its entire 4.6 billion year lifespan. All previous gravitational wave detections have involved the merger of stellar mass black holes. However, unlike black hole mergers, which involve objects that aren't visible, neutron stars generate huge amounts of electromagnetic radiation, providing astronomers with multiple observations of the merger event in gamma rays, X-rays, visible light and radio waves, as well as the original gravitational wave signal. Neutron stars are the extremely dense stellar corpses of stars far more massive than the Sun, which have run out of nuclear fuel, the process which keeps stars like the Sun shining. When these stars die, hydrostatic equilibrium, that's the finely tuned balancing act between the inwards force of gravity, crushing everything down, versus the outwards push of nuclear reactions in the stellar core, ends, and gravity wins, causing the star to suddenly collapse in on itself in what's known as a core collapse or type 2 supernova, an explosion so bright it briefly outshines an entire galaxy. The explosion blasts most of the stellar material into space, seeding future generations of stars. What's left is a dense stellar core, so tightly packed under its own gravity that the positively charged protons and negatively charged electrons making up the core are literally crushed together, forming neutrons, hence the neutron star name. A neutron star merger occurs when two neutron stars orbiting each other in a binary system collide into each other. Little is understood about the physics involved in neutron stars or their mergers. However, it's long been hypothesised that their collisions could be the progenitors of short-duration gamma-ray bursts, which are often described as the most powerful explosions since the Big Bang. In 1916, Professor Albert Einstein first predicted the possibility of gravitational waves being generated by cataclysmic events such as collisions between massive, dense, accelerating objects, such as black holes and neutron stars. Einstein theorised that these gravitational waves would ripple through the very fabric of space-time, radiating out across the universe, causing space-time to literally expand and contract by a tiny amount as it passed. The amount of that expansion and contraction would be less than the diameter of a proton. And that's where gravitational wave detectors come in. These interferometers fire a highly accurate laser, which is split into two beams, sent down two perpendicular four-kilometre-long tunnels. Reflectors at the ends of the tunnels bounce the beams back to the detector. And if a gravitational wave passes through the beams, the beams will return slightly out of sync, evidence of the passage of a gravitational wave. Theory is one thing, but actually building the detectors has been extremely difficult. You see, they need to be accurate enough to take into account everything from passing trains and thunderstorms through to wolves walking in the nearby woods and even the background quantum fluctuations of virtual particles popping into and out of existence. Finally, in September 2015, after years of development, upgrades, changes and improvements, the twin gravitational wave detectors of the LIGO collaboration in Louisiana and Washington State successfully detected gravitational waves generated by the merger of two black holes. It was that discovery which resulted in this year's Nobel Prize for Physics. So far, four confirmed gravitational wave detections have been made involving black hole mergers. The latest in August this year also included the new European Virgo detector in Italy. This new latest fifth detection, which also occurred in August, is special 
because for the first time it involved the collision not of black holes but of neutron stars. The first signs of this historic event came from the Advanced Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory LIGO Virgo collaboration. They quickly issued an emergency notification to astronomers that they had detected a gravitational wave event. At about the same time, NASA's Fermi and ESA's Integral Space Telescopes both detected a short-duration gamma-ray burst, which they designated as GRB 170817A, and which they suspected was caused by the collision of two neutron stars in the galaxy NGC 4993. The coincidence was too great to ignore, and follow-up observations quickly confirmed that the gravitational wave event and the gamma-ray burst were at the same location in the sky, and likely caused by the collision of two neutron stars. The first follow-up optical light observations came in about 11 hours after the event, with the first X-ray emissions detected about nine days later. Radio astronomers with the CSIRO's Australia Telescope Compact Array at Narrabri on the northwestern slopes of country New South Wales monitored the location for more than 40 hours over several weeks, eventually detecting the first radio wave emissions from the gravitational wave event 15 days earlier. Associate Professor Tara Murphy from the University of Sydney who led the radio detection follow-up says her team were able to target the source of the gravitational wave emissions, providing the first ever confirmation of the event by detecting radio waves from the neutron star merger. Our team was using the Australia Telescope Compact Array. As soon as we got a, an alert from LIGO that said this was a neutron star, neutron star merger, we were really excited because all of the previous LIGO detections have been black hole, black hole mergers, which produce no electromagnetic radiation like visible light and radio waves. So as soon as we got the alert this was neutron stars, we knew this was something we might be able to detect. And so well, you pointed the compact array towards the galaxy, 130 million light years away, relatively nearby. That's right. So initially we didn't actually know that this merger had happened in that galaxy. So the initial strategy most groups around the world took was to start scanning all of the 50 or so galaxies in the region that LIGO had detected. LIGO doesn't have very good localization. In other words, it can only tell where the object is to a region about 150 times the size of the moon on the sky. So within that, it could be coming from anywhere. And that's the role of where the conventional telescope came into play, is actually pinpointing the galaxy. A lot of telescopes, both ground-based and orbital, began searching the skies for this. That's right. So alerts were coming in constantly. We were on email around the clock as all the different groups started reporting their observations. So the way it works when there's an extraordinary event like this is that people are sharing that information as soon as possible with the other people in the collaboration so that you can change your observing strategy and maximise potential science that you're getting out of it. So about 11 hours after the original event, there was a detection by an optical telescope that showed a new source that appeared in the galaxy NGC 4993. And so at that point, we changed our strategy. We'd been observing for about an hour at that point on the Australia Telescope Compact Array. And we changed our strategy to start focusing more on that galaxy. And as you did, what happened? So we weren't sure whether we would detect radio emission straight away or not. The theoretical models had a range of predictions from being able to detect radio emission immediately at the point of the explosion or weeks to months later. And so on the first day that we were observing, we observed for 12 hours, but we didn't detect anything. That allowed us straight away to rule out part of the model for the physics that was going on in this event. We knew it was really important to keep monitoring the source. So when two neutron stars merge, it's a very complex event. You get some initial radiation that comes out as a jet. And then as that interacts with the medium around the stars, so in other words, as it, as it blasts out into space, you start detecting the event at other wavelengths. And so where radio came in was, well, we finally made a detection after two weeks of monitoring. We finally made a detection about 15 days after the event. And and that's the first time that we've ever detected radio emission from a gravitational wave event, double neutron star merger. Do you know the masses of the objects? So the initial indication is that they're around 1.2 to 1.6 solar masses. So in other words, a bit more massive than our sun, but pretty similar. And do we know how much mass was converted to gravitational wave energy? Approximately 10 to the 45 joules. So that's actually more than the total energy output by the sun in its entire existence. It's an insane amount of energy. What causes the radio waves? Is that something to do with the electron atmosphere above the merged progenitor or, or do we know? Yeah, it's actually yeah, it's actually from the shock. 
as the shock from the explosion travels out into the interstellar medium, and what I mean by that is obviously you think of space as being a vacuum, but as you probably know, it's not quite a perfect vacuum. There is gas and dust around. And as the shock from the explosion interacts with that, then you get radio emission. You also get some emission from the jet as it's going out into the circumstellar medium, so really close to the stars. So what you're seeing is an interaction between the explosion and the material around the explosion. So this must be letting you tick the boxes on some models and cross out other models as to what's actually going on when neutron stars merge. Absolutely. So this has been uh, an area where there have been many, many theoretical predictions. There are literally hundreds of papers out there predicting the details of the physics that would happen when two neutron stars merge. And the only way that you can choose between those models is to use observational evidence. And of course, that's how science works. We get the physics that we know, we make predictions about what might happen, and then we use observation to rule out or confirm some of those predictions. And so the radio waves that we detect are a really important part of that puzzle, putting together all the bits of information so we can see the full picture. The heart of all this has been the fact that Virgo and LIGO were able to detect gravitational waves coming from this object. The first time it's been detected from a neutron star, that's just got to be gratifying for opening a new window on astronomy. We've seen it with black holes, but not neutron stars before. That's right. I think this has come sooner than everyone expected. So just like the first black hole, black hole merger was detected sooner than everyone expected, virtually as soon as LIGO was turned on, we were really hoping that the astronomy community was really hoping that we would detect a neutron star merger because we could just get so much information about how black holes form, how compact objects behave, how heavy elements such as gold in the universe are produced. So there were so many questions we could answer, but we weren't really expecting, I think, to make such a clear detection so soon. Yeah, because neutron star mergers are really important for things like gold because we think that's, that's how gold's made. That's right. So if you think about where gold comes from, most people would say, obviously, you dig it out of the ground. But where does that gold actually come from? How is gold formed? And not just gold, all of the heavy elements, platinum and so on, how are they created? And one of the main theories for how the amount of gold that we observe could be created is by the really, really dense neutron-rich environment that exists when neutron star merges with another neutron star. Yeah, in fact, when you think about it, it's one of the only environments where it could exist. It pretty much is, exactly. And so in a typical supernova explosion, you also have a really high-energy environment. But what you don't have in most supernova explosions is that really neutron-rich environment with the high energy. So when you combine those two things together in a neutron star merger, it's potentially the perfect condition for generating those heavy elements. And the other thing this discovery has done, of course, it's confirmed uh, in just 1.5 seconds, it's confirmed the theory that uh, short duration gamma ray bursts are caused by neutron star mergers. I think many people are saying it's a bit too soon to completely confirm that, but yes, it, it's very strongly indicative that short gamma ray bursts, which has been a mystery for decades, most probably caused by neutron star mergers. Yeah, when I began this show on ABC News Radio, gamma ray bursts were a complete mystery. You know, we were still describing it as the biggest explosion since the Big Bang and all of a sudden we discovered there were two types of gamma ray bursts short and long duration ones and what's the difference and, and now we're starting to yeah. totally unravel the whole thing. It, it's been a, an incredible voyage of discovery for this show if, if nothing else. That's right I mean it's, it's a whole generation of scientific inquiry at the same time as we're sort of solving some of those old problems, we're at the same time opening up a new window with the possibility of solving new problems and discovering new problems. So this is a, a, a huge turning point in astronomy. Everyone's extremely excited about it. That's Associate Professor Tara Murphy from the University of Sydney and Castro, the Centre of Excellence for All Sky Astrophysics. Meanwhile, Australian National University astronomer Dr Christian Wolfe and colleagues used the Sky Mapper and 2.3 metre telescopes at the Siding Spring Observatory in western New South Wales as part of the search for signals from the neutron star collision. They detected the light from the fireball blasting out from the collision debris into space in the hours and days after the event. In fact, Sky Mapper was the first telescope to report the colour of the fireball, an important indicator of the temperature of the fireball, which was about 6,000 degrees Celsius roughly the same as the surface of the Sun. The ANU's Professor Susan Scott, who's Chief Investigator with OSGRAV, the Centre of Excellence for Gravitational Wave Discovery, says as well as being the first detection of the collision of two neutron stars, it's also the closest and most precisely located gravitational wave signal ever received, and it's the loudest gravitational wave signal ever detected. Scott says the discovery is giving scientists the opportunity 
to learn much more about neutron stars, which currently retain much of their mystery. There are a number of things that make this very significant. As you've said, our first four detections were from binary black hole systems, and we were very excited about that, of course, but it was also a bit of a surprise because the LIGO gravitational wave observatories were designed to actually detect neutron star mergers. So what we'd had was four black hole binary systems colliding, and no neutron star mergers. And so this was, this was something that we were really, really waiting for. And just eight days before we concluded the observing run for LIGO, we had this signal come in. So this is a magnificent discovery on an unprecedented scale. So obviously it's a very exciting time for us in gravitational wave astronomy. What people often fail to understand is that those first detections uh, in September 2015, that was actually the first real confirmation, the first hard evidence we had that black holes really do exist. Up until then, it was all theory. I mean, we were pretty confident with the theory and the observations all seemed to support it, but that was actually the first hard evidence that there really are black holes. That's right. Well, it was, it was a number of firsts, uh, including, you know, the first direct detection of gravitational waves, but you're right. It was the first real hard evidence of black holes themselves, but in particular binary black holes. Mm. I mean, we they were extremely unknown quantity. I mean, one imagined that they must exist out there, but we had no real evidence of them. And, you know, we didn't know if they existed, how many there would be or how long they would take to come together. So, and both black holes and gravitational waves are direct consequences of Einstein's theory. And, you know, how different are those things? And to have them come together in one discovery, that, that was really amazing, I think. You know, we expect so much physics to come out of these binary neutron star mergers. We, you know, there's just so much we don't really know, well, about neutron stars themselves, but also about what happens when they merge. And we have models and so on. But the more of these events that we get now, and in collaboration with our astronomy partners, we're going to be able to pin down and really understand understand the physics of matter at these extreme ranges. Also from the beginning of August we had three gravitational wave detectors so this meant that when the signal came in three detectors we were able to determine a region of the sky which is much smaller than if we had only two and so that leads to the other very exciting part of the discovery is that we were able to rapidly pass this area of sky onto all our astronomy partners and that meant that all the telescopes and satellites around the world absolutely scrambled and redirected their observing schedules to scan that portion of the sky. And that, of course, is one of the big differences is that black hole binaries only emit gravitational waves, but neutron stars also emit a range of electromagnetic signals. And that allowed you to turn radio telescopes towards it? Yes, well, a number of exciting things happened uh, as a result of that. The first one was that the uh, Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope, just 1.7 seconds after the the gravitational wave signal came in, actually got a short gamma ray burst, which could be identified as coming from the same source. This in itself was incredible because, you know, for, for decades, we'd seen these short, highly energetic gamma ray bursts coming in from unknown places in the universe almost daily. And nobody really knew what their origin was, but there was a long held belief that they may be created when neutron stars, two neutron stars merge. And so within 1.7 seconds of our discovery, that long-held theory was confirmed. And we do now know that short gamma ray bursts come from these neutron star mergers. Of course, it wasn't just gamma rays. That's right. Well, the next group to determine solid information about the source was the optical telescope people, because including our sky mapper in Australia, because they actually located within that patch of sky the actual position of where the source came from and the actual galaxy that this binary was associated with. So now we actually knew where the source was and then of course they were able to image it and determine things like the temperature of the fireball that resulted from the merger and so on. Then basically we progressed through the spectrum and we later on after a, um, a number of days, eight or nine days, we had x-ray observations and then a couple of weeks after the 
initial detection of the gravitational wave, the radio people got onto the source. So yes, like I think this is unprecedented in the sheer volume and number of science projects that were, were actually involved in this discovery. And unlike the uh, black hole mergers that we've seen, which were all billions of light years away, this was relatively speaking, fairly close. Yes, well, it, it was definitely by far our closest event at 130 million light years away. As you say, some of the black hole mergers we've had were up to 3 billion light years. But the thing is, to detect these sources, they, they need to be quite close compared with the big binary black hole systems to be able to detect them because... The masses involved are much smaller than we have in our black hole systems. And also the neutron stars are not as dense as black holes. And so these two things together mean that the waves they produce are not as large as we get from these binary systems with two big black holes. That says an incredible amount about the sensitivity of LIGO and Virgo, doesn't it? Absolutely. You know, having three detectors gives us a lot more possibilities with directionality, but also sensitivity. And now we've finished the observing run with LIGO, and in this coming year, we're going to upgrade the LIGO detectors and make them more sensitive. And that means quite simply that we'll be able to see further out into space for all of our events that we expect to detect, including neutron star mergers, we'll be able to see more into space, a bigger volume of space, and therefore we'll get more of them. And when we get more of them, we'll be able to pin down the physics of what's going on much more accurately. The precision needed for these sorts of measurements have to take into account all sorts of, not just trains running down the railroad tracks nearby. Yes, we have names for all our terrestrial noise sources that interfere with our interferometers and uh, one of the recent ones is ravens because we've had ravens tapping on the instrument which has caused disturbance <laughs> but yes every little thing affects what we're doing and has to be accounted for and even a small earthquake in China will knock our instruments out of lock so we have very sophisticated and extensive systems for mitigating all of these noise sources that are produced on Earth and affect our instruments. You guys have even had to consider things like quantum fluctuations, just virtual particles popping into and out of existence along those two, four kilometre long tunnels? Yes, we've had to consider that and lots of other effects as well, like parametric instabilities and things affecting the, the mirrors that the beams reflect off at each end of the, the two arms of the L-shaped detector, just like, you know, photons hitting the mirror and so on. Uh, we, we have to compensate for all these, these effects, and it's a very, very intricate, highly complicated thing, and that's, in a way, why it took us 20 years to get the things working and to be able to deal with all these noise sources so that we could actually see a gravitational wave, you know, when it came through our instruments. And even things like power fluctuations from the power companies that are generating the energy to, to power the beams. Yes, and we, we do get interference from the power supplies that are used, you know, obviously all around our instruments and we get interference at the frequencies of the you know power supply you know 60 hertz or 50 hertz depending on which continent you're on and you can see combs of lines occurring you know at multiples of, of those frequencies and that's incredibly annoying actually when you're trying to develop incredibly sensitive searches those lines are a source of annoyance you've got washington and louisiana online you've now got italy online at pisa with virgo what's next to come online is india a long way off india is still quite a long way off there They've located a site now, and but it takes years to build an interferometer of this type and get it running. So I, I wouldn't say that's going to be any time soon. But also the Japanese underway, in fact, they're further underway with construction of a very sensitive gravitational wave detector. Of course, everything we've mentioned so far is in the Northern Hemisphere. <laughs> yeah, well, that's right. And, you know... Obviously, to optimise the science and the location of the source on the sky, and uh, you know, we need, we optimally need to have one in the southern hemisphere that would really complement the existing network very well. 
I take it it would require a special type of geology, a very stable base to build on? Yes, a very stable base. Obviously, Australia doesn't have as much seismic activity as many other countries, so that's a bonus. If you have it too close to the shore, and Australia has rather a big shore, um, you get wave action problems, the waves pounding, pounding the earth. But yes, you need to take all of these things into consideration. And the, the Japanese have built theirs under a, a thousand metres of granite under a mountain, because we all know that Japan is very seismically uh, active. Well, last year, at the beginning of the year, we announced the first ever detection of gravitational waves, and that had to be right up there at the top or near the top of scientific discovery of the century. Well, this current discovery is very, very close to that, because although it's not the first detection of gravitational waves, we've already done that, it's really the start of global multi-messenger astronomy where gravitational waves are going to be often the initial messenger and then we're going to get information about where the source is, roughly speaking, and then all these astronomy projects all over the world will be able to rush in and try to get information about what's going on. That's Professor Susan Scott from the Australian National University. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Astronomers have for the first time measured the distance to a star-forming region on the far side of the Milky Way galaxy. The study, reported in the journal Science, reaches deep into the Milky Way's Terra Incognita, nearly doubling the previous record for distance measurements within the galaxy. Distance measurements are crucial for understanding the structure of the Milky Way. Most of our galaxy's material, consisting principally of stars, gas and dust, lies within a flattened disk, in which our solar system is also embedded. It's a bit like trying to determine the shape of the forest when you're stuck in the middle of the woods. Because we can't see our galaxy face on, its structure, including the actual shape of its spiral arms, can only be mapped by measuring distances to specific objects within the galaxy. For the new study, astronomers used a technique called trigonometric parallax to measure the precise distance to the star 61 Cygni in the constellation Cygnus the Swan. The technique measures an apparent change in position of the target object compared to background stars when viewed from opposite sides of Earth's orbit around the Sun. It's the same effect you'll get if you hold your finger in front of your nose and then look at it alternatively by closing one eye and then the other. The finger will appear to move from side to side. By measuring the angle of an object's apparent shift in position across the sky, it allows astronomers to use simple trigonometry to directly calculate the distance to that object. The smaller the measured angle, the greater the distance. The study is part of the Bessel Bar and Spiral Structure Legacy Survey. Bessel makes it possible to measure parallaxes a thousand times more accurately than when the technique was first invented by Frederick Wilhelm Bessel way back in 1838. To carry out their measurements, scientists used the Very Long Baseline Array, a continent-wide radio telescope system using 10 radio antenna dishes distributed across North America, Hawaii and the Caribbean, and all linked electronically, acting as one big single radio antenna dish. The resolution allows scientists to measure minute angles associated with great distances. In this case, the measurement was roughly equal to the angular size of a cricket ball or baseball on the moon. The new Very Long Baseline Array observations measured a distance of more than 66,000 light-years to the star-forming region G007.45 plus 00.05 on the opposite side of the Milky Way from the Sun and well past the galactic centre some 27,000 light-years away. The measurement's important because most of the stars and gas in our galaxy are within this newly measured distance from the Sun. With a very long baseline array, astronomers now have the capability to measure enough distances to accurately trace the galaxy's spiral arms and learn their true shapes, and consequently the true shape of our galaxy. The new observations measure the distance to a region where new stars are being formed. Such regions include areas where molecules of water and methanol act as natural amplifiers of radio signals, known as masars, the radio wave equivalent of lasers for light waves. The effect makes radio signals appear bright and readily observable with radio telescopes. 
The Milky Way has hundreds of such star-forming regions that include Mazars, thereby providing plenty of potential mileposts to help map the galaxy. The goal is to finally reveal what our galaxy really looks like if we could leave the galaxy and travel outwards perhaps a million light years and view it face on from above or below, rather than along the plane of the disk, which is how we actually see it. And it's worth remembering that it was only a few years ago that astronomers first confirmed that our Milky Way galaxy wasn't a grand spiral, but rather a more elongated barred spiral design. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. A new study claims Titan, the largest of Saturn's more than 60 moons, has surprisingly intense rainstorms. The findings, reported in the journal Nature Geoscience, are based on the detection of alluvial fans on Titan's surface by NASA's Cassini spacecraft. Although the storms are relatively rare, they occur less than once per Titan year, which is 29 and a half Earth years, they still occur far more frequently than scientists had expected. The study's senior author, Associate Professor Jonathan Mitchell from the University of California in Los Angeles, says he was surprised at the frequency as he expected these storms to occur only once a millennium. The storms create massive floods over terrain that are otherwise deserts. It rains on Titan. That rain then forms streams and rivers, which eventually flow into lakes and seas. Titan also has storm clouds that bring seasonal monsoon-like downpours. And while all that sounds very Earth-like, It's worth remembering Titan's precipitation is liquid methane and ethane rather than liquid water, which on Titan forms much of the surface bedrock because of the extreme cold. The research is all based on climate models, which found the most intense methane storms dump at least a third of a metre of rain a day, which is close to what hit Houston, Texas recently from Hurricane Harvey. The study also found that the extreme methane rainstorms may imprint the moon's icy surface in much the same way that extreme rainstorms on Earth shape our planet's rocky surface. On Earth, intense storms can trigger large flows of sediment that spread into the lowlands, forming cone-shaped features called alluvial fans. Scientists also found that regional patterns of extreme rainfall on Titan are correlated with recent detections of alluvial fans, suggesting they too were formed by intense rainstorms. The findings also demonstrate the role of extreme precipitation in shaping Titan's surface. The same principle also likely applies to Mars, which has large alluvial fans of its own. Greater understanding about the relationships between precipitation and a planetary surface could lead to new insights about the impact of climate change on Earth and other planets. Although Titan's alluvial fans are a new discovery, scientists have had eyes on the Moon's surface for years. In fact, shortly after Cassini reached Saturn back in 2004, radar and other instruments showed vast sand dunes dominating Titan's lower latitudes, while lakes and seas dominated its higher latitudes. The alluvial fans are mostly located between 50 and 80 degrees latitude, close to the centres of the Moon's northern and southern hemispheres, but generally slightly closer to the poles than to the equator. Such variations in surface features suggest the Moon has corresponding regional variations in precipitation. That's because rainfall and subsequent runoff play a key role in eroding land and filling lakes, while the absence of rainfall promotes the formation of dunes. Previous models had shown that liquid methane generally concentrates on Titan's surface at higher latitudes. But no previous study had investigated the behaviour of extreme rainfall events, Rainfall events that might be capable of triggering major sedimentary transport and erosion. Nor had previous studies shown the connection of these events to surface observations. Scientists primarily use computer simulations to study Titan's hydrological cycle. That's because observations of actual precipitation on Titan are difficult to obtain, and because, given the length of each year on Titan, Cassini only observed the Moon for three seasons. Scientists found that while rain mostly accumulates near the poles where Titan's major lakes and seas are located, the most intense rainstorms occur near 60 degrees latitude, precisely the region where alluvial fans are most heavily concentrated. The study suggests that Titan's intense storms develop because of sharp differences between the wetter, cooler weather at the higher latitudes and the drier, warmer conditions at lower latitudes. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary.
The first xeon-ion collisions have been undertaken at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, the European Organisation for Nuclear Research. The eight-hour event allowed the ATLAS, ALICE, CMS and LHCB experiments situated around the 27-kilometre-long underground ring to record xeon nuclei collisions for the first time. Xeon atoms consist of 54 protons and between 70 and 80 neutrons depending on the isotope. Xeons are noble gas present in Earth's atmosphere in only very minute quantities. The Xeon collisions involved atoms with 54 protons and 75 neutrons, similar to the usual heavy iron lead collisions usually undertaken at the world's largest atom smasher located deep below the Franco-Swiss border near Geneva. The experiment allowed physicists to test the collider's capabilities using a new type of beam, obtaining new results. The Xeon-ion collisions involved the same types of interactions normally undertaken with lead ions. However, because the Xeon nuclei have less mass, the collision geometry was different. The collisions are designed to replicate the sort of superheated quark-gluon plasma which filled the universe in the first moments after the Big Bang 13.8 billion years ago. It was a time before quarks were confined by the strong nuclear force mediated by gluons into the protons and neutrons of atoms. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. A Japanese H-2A rocket has successfully launched a new navigation satellite. The quasi-Zenith satellite system Mikibiki-4 spacecraft will complete Japan's new constellation designed to improve satellite navigation in Japanese cities where tall buildings affect car sat-nav reception. The mission blasted off from JAXA's Tanegashima Space Center 40 kilometers south of Kyushu. The 4,000 kilogram satellite built by Mitsubishi Engineering was designed to be compatible and supplement the existing American GPS satellite navigation system. The new spacecraft was placed into what's called an eccentric geosynchronous orbit, ranging in altitude from 32,600 kilometers up to 39,000 kilometers, with the satellite moving in a figure eight pattern centered around 135 degrees longitude. The spacecraft has a 15 year expected lifespan. The flight was Japan's sixth space launch this year and the fifth this year for its H-2A rocket. The mission was also the 36th flight of the H-2A rocket which first flew back in August 2001. The next H-2A launch will carry a new climate change monitoring satellite for JAXA, the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency. I'm Stuart Gary. This is Space Time. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with the Science Report. And a new study warns that mothers who are exposed to higher levels of air pollution could be giving birth to kids whose DNA is more likely to age faster. The findings reported in the Journal of the American Medical Association Pediatrics is based on measurements of the air pollution around the homes of 641 pregnant mothers. The study then examined the length of their baby's telomeres. Telomeres are strands at the ends of DNA which gradually get shorter over the course of an individual's lifetime and are consequently thought to be closely linked to life expectancy. Researchers found that all other things being equal, mothers who are exposed to more air pollution particles bigger than 2.5 thousandths of a millimetre tended to give birth to babies with shorter telomeres, indicating a possible shorter life expectancy. Cyberbullying is hard enough to deal with, but what about if the perpetrator is yourself? A new study reported in the Journal of Adolescent Health has found that some teens actually post mean comments about themselves anonymously online. The researchers wanted to determine the extent of this digital self-harm and surveyed some 5,500 American teenagers between the ages of 12 and 17. They found around 6% of teens had posted mean comments about themselves online, either using false names or anonymously. Interestingly, the research showed the numbers were slightly higher for boys than girls. Scientists admit they still know very little about this and haven't yet been able to determine whether or not it's analogous to self-harm through cutting or other similar activities. 
Nevertheless, they have called for the development of new therapies and programming to provide teens with help before they decide to hurt themselves. A new study has found that captive killer whales or orca have terrible teeth caused mostly by chewing the concrete and steel tank surfaces which confine them. The findings, reported in the archives of oral biology, are based on research that photographed the mouths of 29 orca kept in captivity by a company in both the United States and Spain. Researchers found all 29 whales had some form of severe damage to their teeth, with more than half having been to the dentist to have their teeth drilled. Given the size of an orca's tooth root, and the fact that the mammals have very similar nervous systems to humans, researchers say the injuries are likely to have been extremely painful and are therefore seen as a clear marker of how the health and well-being of these intelligent animals is being compromised by being kept in captivity. There are new warnings that the Earth's ozone layer may be under threat again. Way back in the 1980s, the international community initiated the Montreal Protocols, which banned the use of specific chemicals such as chlorofluorocarbons and related chlorinated hydrocarbons that were depleting the Earth's protective ozone layer. Now, a new study, reported in the Journal of Atmospheric Chemistry and Physics, suggests there are new threats which aren't regulated by the treaty. Chemicals like dichloromethanes, which are used in many industrial processes, from paint stripping to pharmaceutical production, are now being detected in areas far from their originating source. Scientists warn that if these chemicals are swept up into the stratosphere in significant quantities, they could cause a new generation of ozone damage. Bit of good news now, and a new study claims having up to three and a half alcoholic drinks a day could be linked to a lower risk of heart failure. But the study also warns it doesn't lower the risk of heart palpitations. The findings are reported in the journal JACC Heart Failure. Researchers tracked the drinking habits and heart health of 23,000 people for just over eight years. They found similar results when they looked at those who mostly drank wine, regardless of their age, sex, social status, or whether or not they ate a Mediterranean diet. And finally for now, and just in time for Halloween, a new study reveals that pumpkin-coloured zombies could be running rampant in a local swamp. The findings reported in the journal Exosphere aren't quite as spooky as they sound, because these aren't flesh-eating humanoids of the walking dead variety, but rather tiny shrimp infected by microscopic parasites. Even so, their growing abundance in nutrient fueled salt marshes may well be a portent of future threats to humans. The study is building on a long-term experiment in which researchers have been adding nitrogen to a New England salt marsh every year since 2004. Their goal was to investigate how coastal ecosystems were responding to nutrient-rich runoff from fertilised fields, wastewater treatment plants and other human sources. For their experiment, researchers chose a flatworm-like parasite and one of its hosts, a small hopping shrimp known as a marsh hopper. The parasite host pair were chosen both because of their abundance and when infected, the shrimp changes both its colour and behaviour. In fact, once infected, the shrimp wander out into the open unaware of their changing colour from brown to orange, making them easy targets for birds. However, it turns out this is all part of the parasite's plan. You see, in order to reproduce, the parasite needs to get into the gut of a bird. And so, in order to get into the bird's gut, it turns the shrimp into a suicidal zombie, a sort of orange neon sign screaming, eat me. Researchers found that nutrient enrichment dramatically increased both the number of shrimp and parasites. In fact, the prevalence of parasites increased some 13 times higher in the nutrient-enriched marshes, while the biomass density of the infected shrimp was only 11 times higher. Researchers say the results could have serious implications for human health because humans also have their parasites, including those causing malaria, schizomyosis and West Nile virus, all of which have their own aquatic hosts and vectors. If these human parasites respond like the shrimp's parasites, nutrient pollution would enhance their populations as well, thereby promoting disease. You're listening to Space Time, I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, Audio Boom, YouTube, from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favourite podcast download provider. The shows also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., around the world on TuneIn Radio, and as part of Virgin Australia's in-flight entertainment. 
Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog, where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and other things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one worded in lower case, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Space Time with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Space Time with Stuart Gary. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 